everybody. We're going to go ahead and go over chapter four today. We're going to do the actual chapter section first, and then we're going to go into um, the actual like readings and supplemental readings secondary. All right. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and power through this and see what we can learn. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so this is inscribing gender on the body. So we're gonna talk about, again, some of those things are gonna be mentioned and I'm gonna revert you back to the chapter three lecture. And again, um, I used a chapter three lecture that is more in, like encompassing than your chapter even got into. So we're going to um, kind of build from that. All right, so first let's talk about canvas because I love that this chapter is really focused on the body, really focused on that intersection between disability and gender, that intersection between gender and, um, I don't know, um, body, the gender and eating disorders, gender and the ways in which our body is ascribed to gender. Um, and so there's one of the sections in there that says, let's talk about canvas. And it talks about what the assumptions are of bodies as we walk through campus based on kind of the way in which campus is laid out. So what are the assumptions when you go into a bathroom at EKU? Is there always a handicap stall? Is the doorway accessible to wheelchairs? Is there, are there rails for those who have trouble with mobility? Um, how high are the sinks? How high are the mirrors on the sinks? Um, how many buildings have entrances with stairs? I know that EKU campus, I traversed EKU campus in a wheelchair for a good while and stairs are something that are part of a lot of the entrances and you have to go all the way around the buildings to get to some um, inclusive entrances. And there are a lot of doorways that wheelchairs don't fit in. Um, what about water fountains? Um, what about the dorms, are the dorms set up accessible to those with mobility issues or with um, even maybe um, those, like I've been in some of the, the dorm sitting areas, are they accessible to those who, like do they have multi-levels that are not very, that are not easily labeled to someone who maybe has a um, walking um, stick or and or is blind or, um, something of that nature. How much of our campus is geared towards like just in general being able to be an able-bodied and walk up and down hills or over across long distances? That campus is very spread out. Um, trying to think of some of the other things, but all of these really talking about this idea that um, campus assumes things or just in general, the spaces that we occupy assume things about bodies and most of the assumptions are very able, are, are that you are very able and um, capable of all of the things that range in body movement. Um, and that is not always the case. So that ideal body. Um, so what is America's ideal beauty standard? And so like I did a, um, I did an example of this in a course I took one time and the professor had us write down things. And I took note of this um, because I've seen it done in several classes since, and it always seems to be very similar. And so um, when we talk about this, no matter whether it's male or female, almost always the ideal body type is white um, with some like tan to them, some color complexion that's very level, that doesn't have blemishes, um, very able-bodied. Um, and with females, it was tall, slim, but not too tall. It's like a very distinct range. <laughs> um, slim, but not too slim. Blonde, bright eyes, wavy, full-bodied, long hair, um, dressed to the nine, um, no tattoos, no body hair, except eyebrows and on your head. And the eyebrows are very neatly trimmed and kept up with um, for males, it was toned, um, very tall, toned, but still slim, um, short hair, very few tattoos, if any, dark hair, bright eyes, square jaw, some very, very groomed body hair, right? And how do we know this? We know this because we see, um, we see this in media, we see this in advertising, um, we see this with social sanctions for those that don't meet these goals. And really, these goals are mostly unobtainable. 
for a lot of us, um, especially the whiteness, especially the able-bodied. Um, and definitely like we can't control how tall we are. Um, in a lot of ways, we can't control how slim we are. Um, we can't control what color hair we have unless we want to dye it. Like, but we do that and we, um, okay. oh, sorry. Happy. It's okay. Sorry, the mailman came by. This is what happens when you do lectures from home. Um, but we see social sanctions in so many ways. And I revert back to, you know, how we police gender. But I think it's interesting to kind of really put words to some of those ideal types. Even those ideal types, you're not going to find many people that can meet them. And I think that that's by design um, because it makes us, it, it drives that force of continuing to consume to try. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, four of the main points that they wanted to talk about in this chapter were that um, that body is and, and genders through your body is changeable and fluid, um, and that the notions of beauty are also changing, changeable and fluid. What we thought was beautiful um, as a Eurocentric society in the 1700s is very different than now. Um, what we thought, like what Indigenous people think is beautiful compared to like white corporate America is very, very different what um, the beauty standards are for any specific culture or subculture within those cultures is very specific. And I think that that matters. Um, beauty and power. Um, so there's power in meeting the physical attributes of, um, especially social power, in meeting the physical attributes that are part of that ideal body type. And those grant you privileges and acceptance and leeway in all forms and institutions we have in our social dynamics. Um, it affords you um, partnerships, it affords you um, economic opportunities, it affords you schooling opportunities, it affords you um, promotion opportunities, it affords you all sorts of different things because you meet a specific idea of what they want uh, a position or a person to look like. Um, beauty enforcement is complex. So really talking through this, meaning that um, we both enforce it on each other and also push against it in ways together. So like we talk about maybe like imager or Instagram or those things that are driven by photo type uh, media sources. And you look at that, you're going to see a lot of the ideal beauty type, and you're going to see a lot of that influx and that promoted, but you're also going to see space um, where that is pushed back against and space to give new forms of beauty, homes and housing and representation. And so as we look through those things, we need to understand that in the same spaces and dynamics that we enforce beauty, we also bend it, shift it, mold it, make it may be different and what something that is more obtainable and something that feels more accessible and beautiful. Um, and then we're going to talk about beauty and the links to capitalism. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Um, the consequences for not meeting the ideal beauty set. So let's talk about these. And again, this is not nearly an exhaustive list. This is just quick, quick things that they really talked about in the book. And that was really negative self-image, social sanctions. Again, we talked about in some of the other gender things, self-harm, feeling invisible, so when you consistently watch media and consistently watch um, even advertising and your self-image, your idea of what you are via your gender, via your body type, via whatever is never represented, it makes it really hard to connect to that. And it makes you feel as a human being invisible amongst your society. And that in and of itself can have very harmful and damaging impact, especially for young people. Um, and then we had taught, it talks a lot about eating disorders as well. Um, and we're going to talk about this last thing about this bathroom debate. Um, so, and it's one of the subtopics towards the end of the chapter. Um, in the last, I don't know, six, seven years, you see a lot of, I mean, these were happening before, but they really sparked interest when um, Trump took office. And you saw a lot of people promoting bathroom, um, usually GOP um, politicians, promoting bathroom bills that 
blocked trans from using the bathroom of their gender identity and made people use the bathroom of their sex assigned at birth. Now, there was not a whole lot talking about how they would enforce this and that was also problematic, but I wanna make a few things clear when it comes to talking about this topic. Trans people aren't attacking anyone in bathrooms. They are actually much more likely to experience harm within those environments than the straight people um, and straight cis people. Um, so talking through, and, and that's not to say that trans people aren't straight people because they can be, um, but they're, there's a lot more risk to trans individuals in public bathrooms than there are to from trans people being in public bathrooms, if that makes sense. Also, there was a lot of propaganda using violence against women as the problem that they were trying to solve in creating these things, but they weren't problem solving um, the majority of places that violence against women happen. They didn't talk about domestic violence or interpersonal violence in the same ways. They weren't pushing for um, bills to make college campuses more safer. They weren't talking about bills to really get down to where the research shows violence against women, um, ideas that can really affect positive change in that department. And as somebody who researches specifically this topic, it was really, really frustrating to watch that topic get used as propaganda um, to lack inclusion and to police trans bodies in bathroom sakes. Um, and really it was, well, men can dress up as women and go in and harm um, women. So the issue still wasn't trans people, it was men dressing as women to hurt people. And if we have a society where that is such a big threat that we need to create and keep trans people also out of bathrooms and be able to use the restroom, then we probably need to deal with violence against women and not necessarily be policing trans people, but poli policing the, the messaging we're sending to um, men in order to keep perpetuating this as um, a possibility. Um, and then again, anyone in a bathroom for a reason that's not related to bathrooms, using the restroom, uh, using the mirror, using the sink, whatever, is probably a separate issue in and of itself, right? People don't just go hang out in bathrooms. And if they are, that's probably creepy. If they're doing something like stalking people in the bathroom or um, being inappropriate in a bathroom setting, that in and of itself should probably be, be dealt with. But making a bill about this was considerably directed towards finding a, a propaganda source that they could use in order to police trans bodies um, and, and women's bodies. Because you never heard this about, you never heard this in regards to trans men going into men's bathrooms. And the reason for that is, is because there's this like inherent idea that those bodies that have a penis are inherently harmful um, because of the messaging they receive as part of masculinity. And that in and of itself is probably something we should deal with, but we should probably not be using that as a rationale. No, not probably. We should not be using that as a rationale to exclude trans people from having bathrooms where they can be, um, where they can use the restroom. Um, and so that's kind of the last part of this chapter. Um, in the next series, we're going to start working through some of those individual uh, lectured pieces and go from there.